It's spooky season, and we're all in need of some suitable scary content. Even the kids. We've been thinking a lot about family-friendly frights. Until the little ones are old enough for our favorite slashers, we've decided to revisit one of the all-time best gateways into the genre. This one is for the 90s kids. We're getting nostalgic today and giving everyone some goosebumps. This children's show was a staple for every future horror fan and is still scaring kids today. It's no surprise either. It featured some horrific monsters and a big candy bowl full of twists. But which of these villains was truly the worst among them? I'm Kyle with Wicked Binge, and today we'll be ranking Goosebumps entities from bad to evil. Now viewer beware, you're in for some very nostalgic scares. For this list, we're going to try to cover as many monsters as possible. That being said, we are going to steer away from inanimate objects, even when they're cursed. We'll also be excluding humans from our list, barring some serious supernatural powers. It's more fun to look at what the mad scientists are creating for a show like this rather than the scientists themselves. At least mostly. So with that out of the way, let's rank some bad guys. We'll be starting out with the bad. These are characters that are not trying to do evil or cause harm as their main motive. It's just something that happens. First up is Clarissa from Be Careful What You Wish For. Honestly, is anyone surprised? She's by far the most wholesome person on this list. She doesn't mean to do anyone harm. All the trouble that she causes is thanks to her attempts to actually repay a favor she feels she owes. It's just that magic can be hard sometimes, and children aren't good at making exact wishes. Next up we have Dr. Merkin from My Hairiest Adventure. Yeah, we know, here we are breaking our own rules about mad scientists, but we had to sneak one on here and Dr. Merkin was our pick. He's interesting because he also doesn't mean any harm. He's just testing his technology of turning animals into humans. Probably some sort of skin irritation. He's only the bad guy in the context of the episodes, because the children don't understand why they're turning back into dogs. He's just an innocent man trying to change the fabric of the universe. I mean, when does that ever backfire? But it's gotta be pretty scary for those dogs when they don't know what's going on. He makes the list just for not considering the feelings of those poor pups. Following him are Mr. and Mrs. Dark from The Girl Who Cried Monster. Now, they weren't the only monsters in this episode, mind you. We chose them over the librarian because, as they said themselves, the town only needs one family of monsters. They came out on top, so they made the list. Sure, they eat people, but the person they ate in this case was also a threat to the town. If we had to consider monsters slaying bad, there'd be many more brave children on this list. Besides, they spared the neighbor kids, so they're getting a tentative pass from us. Next, we have the Mud Monster from You Can't Scare Me. He avoids being considered more evil just on account of being so pathetic. Now, we have to talk about your aggressive behavior. We're honestly more afraid of the children in this one rather than the monster. He may mean harm, but he's not exactly good at bringing it about. One child is able to talk him to death, and his other potential victims are easily able to outrun him. All in all, he may be mean, but he's not exactly a threat. We move on to our next pick, the Worms from Go Eat Worms. They were more malicious than any of our previous picks. They targeted one child who they were determined to get revenge on. But notice how we said revenge. Todd definitely started the war with the Worms. He basically tortured them for fun and implied that they don't feel pain. We're not saying that we were rooting against him, but it's hard to blame the worms for being defensive. We sure do wish he had learned his lesson in time. Speaking of other species, our next entry are the ants from Awesome Ants. What if ants were the dominant species and not humans? This episode answered that horrific question while also showing us that humans shouldn't be trusted with control either. It is unsettling to watch the ants swarm and grow at unnatural rates while still thinking we're in control. But the truth is that once we learn the ants are our overlords in this world, it doesn't really seem as though we're being mistreated. So that's something, right? Following those creepy crawlies are the reality police from Don't Go to Sleep. You could make the case that they're just doing their jobs, you won't get away this time. That argument is why we're only considering them bad and not evil. Still, they are pretty harsh on a child. 
there's a lot of mental torment that they put poor Matt through just for saying he doesn't like reality. And honestly, who doesn't have their gripes with reality these days? Rounding out this tier is armchair technology from Click. While we're not going to focus on the actual universal remote featured in this episode, we want to talk about the company that made it. We don't doubt that their intentions were good. Unlike many ominous products in the show, the people behind the remote seem to know the difference between right and wrong. They actually give many warnings to Seth about not abusing the product they sent him. Please follow all instructions and warnings. Unfortunately, we have no choice but to question their methods. They sell the universal remote, knowing it's far too powerful to be used safely, to anyone in the back of the magazine. They say repeatedly how important it is to listen to the warnings, but only seem willing to dole out warnings one at a time during inopportune hours. They also have the ability to see him use the remote and struggle with it, but refuse to help him when he runs into trouble. They're willing to punish him for misusing the device, but unwilling to give him any pointers about using it properly. Seth takes his fair share of the blame here, but really, what did Armchair expect to happen? We move into our second tier, the Dark and the Demented. These are entities who mean more harm and have a higher chance of actually carrying it out. Kicking off this middle tier, we have the Scarecrows from the Scarecrow Walks at Midnight. There isn't a whole lot to say about them. The magic that powered them may be evil, and that evil magic fell into the wrong hands. But the Scarecrows were being controlled, and aside from being a pretty terrifying threat, they didn't do too much. Not saying they couldn't, just saying they didn't. And it keeps them at the very top of this list. After them is Brian Coulson from the Phantom of the Auditorium. He is actively trying to capture another student to spend an eternity in darkness with him. That's why he's in the second tier but we do think he's troubled and confused. Like all good phantoms, he is tormented by a tragic backstory that clouds his judgment. We can't give him a pass, but we can rank him with sympathy. And since the story had a relatively happy end, we can be a bit lenient as well. Speaking of sympathy, our next slot goes to the robots from Shocker on Shock Street. It's never good to turn against the man who made you, but sometimes he tricks you into thinking you're human before using you to run safety tests with. Since it was also a surprise to us, as the audience, learning that Aaron and Marty were not human children, we're more inclined to side with them. We also felt lied to, after all. When they turn against their creator, Mr. Wright, we understand a little better why they did it. Still, they are potentially harmful to humans and therefore must be put here. Moving on to the Saddlers from Ghost Beach. We're talking about the little dead children Saddlers and the trusted relative Saddlers. Virtually everyone on this amply named beach is a Saddler ghost, and hiding it. Join us! We dug such nice graves for you! They all want the still living Saddlers to come join them in death. We feel really bad for these poor, outnumbered, living relatives. You might be surprised at our next entry, which is Slappy from Return of the Living Dummy. He's such an iconic villain of the series. You may expect him to be lower on our list, closer to the evil side of the spectrum. We don't doubt that he has evil intentions, especially since he's quick to enact his dastardly plans on the very children that could help him. But in terms of the evil he's actually able to accomplish, there's less of it. Wasn't very nice of you to dump me in the sewer like that. Maybe it's his size, maybe it's the compulsion to make nasty quips, but Slappy doesn't ever make a lot of progress on causing physical harm to anything but objects. Following Slappy is El Sydney from Bad Hair Day. The more memorable magician is of course Amazo, but the twist of course is that he was the good one. The evil one was none other than El Sydney, a mean magician with a real magic wand and a talent for turning people into rabbits. It's one thing to turn his rival into a rabbit, especially since Amazo kept him as a rabbit for a long time before he was helped. But to also turn the boy that was helping him into a rabbit, that's a little low even for him. There are worse things that you could do with powerful magic, which is why he's in the middle tier. But the fact that he succeeds with this and sticks to his evil plan makes him one of the larger threats on the show. Up next, we have the ghosts from the Headless Ghost. While there was only one ghost named in the title, there were three ghosts in the episode. The Headless Ghost was content once he got his head back, 
but the other two kept on scaring and attempting to capture the kids at Hill House. And Hill House is a fun little callback to classic horror for the adults watching. We're not going to place them any lower because the proprietor of Hill House and Lead Ghost did give the children several warnings before making any aggressive moves. But we can't put them any higher because they did try to trap a child in a painting forever. After them is the plant father from Stay Out of the Basement. On the one hand, we understand why an accidental plant clone might feel threatened by the scientist who makes him. The plant version of Mr. Brewer was just trying to take his spot and secure his own place in the world, where he didn't have to be a science experiment. On the other hand, he did kidnap the real Mr. Brewer and was very creepy to his children. He tried to force them to eat plant food and even went so far as to attack another doctor that came to visit. It makes us very concerned about what he would have done were he not thwarted properly by the children. Now we get to the creeps from Calling All Creeps. Again, we do not condone taking over the human race. But if you're a creep, that's just what you're inclined to do. It's probably hard to fight your nature. Creeps rule. What saves the creeps from being placed into the actual evil tier is actually not their nature, it's their plan. They're not trying to kill children, they're just trying to create more creeps. If this is how creeps are born, we think it's not so wrong that they just have the best in mind for their species. And rounding out our middle tier are the reflections from Let's Get Invisible. The only thing that stops them from being flat out in the evil tier is that we do sort of understand where they're coming from. If you lived in an icy mirror world and had to trick someone into taking your place to come out, well, you could argue that it's a survival thing. Other than their motive being reasonable, they are some of the most dangerous entities in the show. The reflections get physically violent when they need to assert control, and seem merciless about their decision to escape. Worst of all, one of them succeeds in staying out in the real world, meaning they're not only brutal, but they're effective. And finally, we move into the evil category. These are truly the worst of the worst on the show, with the means and will to harm any who oppose them. Kicking off this final tier, we have Aunt Dahlia from An Old Story. This episode might actually be more uncomfortable as an adult than it was frightening as a child. Aunt Dahlia uses some sort of magical prune juice to prematurely age her nephews before selling them to her friends as husbands. She's at the top of the list because she's not very effective at doing this. She keeps an antidote to the prune juice, baby food, lying around in her kitchen and ends up being aged into dust herself. In terms of motives though, this is one of the darkest, most convoluted, and evil plans on the show. We're very, very happy that she didn't get away with any of this. Following is the Masked Mutant from Attack of the Mutant. We think it's interesting that the Masked Mutant actually needs someone to fight him to feel validated. After all, what's a supervillain without a hero to defeat? The fact that he needs to be doing evil to someone made us inclined to put him in the evil tier. The fact that his exploits are dragging in innocent children to oppose him confirmed that idea. But still, we left him near the top of the list because he's easily tricked. We may get a whole villain monologue about how he's defeated all the heroes, but the boy is able to trick him pretty easily when it comes right down to it. So we don't get to see a whole lot of the wicked deeds we're sure he's capable of. Next are the Lawn Gnomes from Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes. Now, we have given some leniency to species that are just trying to expand their own kind. Likewise, we haven't considered mischief to be as evil as actual violence. So you may be surprised to find just how alarmed we are by these gnomes. Their mischief is destructive, but not more than slappies. But we did think that they were more violent though. There's a lot of anger wrapped up in small packages here. When they're chasing down the children, they seem to be very aggressive. It's only the saving grace of the lights that keep them from adding more gnomes to their collection. When they're finally successful in that, it's none too pretty either. After them is the shadow from the ghost next door. This guy was bad news. There's the obvious reason for putting him here in the evil section. He tried to kill a kid. If he had been successful, he would have been able to take over the child's body, giving him a sort of life again. By midnight tonight, he is destined to leave the land of the living. That's plenty all on its own. But then there's the fact that he's also misleading little ghost children along the way. Little girls who are coming to terms with the fact that they're dead have enough to worry about. They don't need creepy shadow men trying to make them prank mailmen. That's just weird and unnecessary. We move into a shared slot now. Werewolves from both Wolfskin and the Werewolf of Fever Swamp. 
These are two separate kinds of werewolves with two different mythologies behind them, but we do feel that they are equally evil. While the wolf force takes over the human being in both instances, making the human less to blame for their actions on the full moon. That's where a lot of the evil comes from. It's not just that it's killing animals and endangering the human population of their respective cities. It's that the wolves are actually turning innocent people into ravenous monsters. It's also historically where a lot of the fear comes from in werewolf legends. And despite the twists that these episodes both take with the original wolf lore, we think they do justice to that fear and evil alike. On a similar note, we have vampires from both Vampire Breath and Welcome to Dead House. Again, two different episodes, two wildly different takes on the aforementioned creatures. As a matter of fact, in Welcome to Dead House, the word vampire isn't actually used, and they seem to be more of a vampire slash zombie hybrid in design. But we're applying the label to both kinds of bloodsucker because, again, we think they're around the same level of evil, despite their differences. Although they're more whimsical, almost comedic in Vampire Breath, He's got no fangs! <sighs> they are still power hungry. It's only the fact that the children are related to the powerful Count Nightwing that ultimately spares them from having their blood tasted. In Welcome to Dead House, there's a whole crew of undead waiting to attack the unsuspecting family that moves into the small town of Dark Falls. They seem to be less power hungry, but more normal hungry. Their thirst for blood is intense and is only likely to get worse. While they weren't successful in killing the Benson family, let's pretend for a second that they had been. They have a whole town full of people feeding on the new families, but they've also said that when they feed on a person, that person comes back to join the ranks of undead. Great place to raise the kids. With fewer and fewer people moving into Dark Falls and a large number of undead to feed constantly, this is going to become a much bigger problem at some point in the future. That's a whole town of evil just waiting to be unleashed. Now we get to Mr. Toggle from Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. There is a lot to unpack with this guy. He was a bad piano student, so he started creating robots to be good at the piano for him. But he can't make their hands right, so none of them are actually any good at the piano. So then he programs one, Mr. Screech, who tries to take the good hands of children who aren't good at playing the piano. It's a wild plan that can only be created by someone truly evil and lazy, but mostly evil. Next, we have the staff of Perfect School from Perfect School. This is one terrifying boarding school. It abducts difficult children and sends home clones of them to behave in their place. We reluctantly give them some credit because they don't hurt the abducted children, which arguably makes them better than some of the monsters on our list who would have hurt or eaten the children. Still, we had to rank them as pretty evil because separating kids from their families and holding them captive is still not a good look. Also, they're doing this on a pretty large scale, which is terrifying. On to another shared slot, we have Sarah Beth and her Monster Blood, from Monster Blood. Sarah Beth was practicing dark magic and had malicious intentions to begin with. We feel like this earns her a mention on the list, especially since she says the Monster Blood that takes up the larger portion of the slot is hers. But mostly, we're here to talk about the Monster Blood. I mean, there's a reason that the episode isn't called Sarah Beth. Monster Blood is hard to define but seems to be a sentient kind of green ooze that feeds off of anything it touches. Whereas a lot of the entities in our evil list have had evil motives, but not been the most effective at implementing them, it's the exact opposite with monster blood. We don't have any reason to suspect that it's good or evil with what it thinks. We're not even sure if it does think. All we know is that it is really, really good at eating whatever and whomever it desires. It gets a lot of evil done in the world before it gets destroyed. Next up are the aliens from Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns. While the kids just think it's cool to have alien friends, there is the big revelation in this one that the aliens are responsible for the deaths of multiple adults in neighboring towns. We want you to trick or treat forever! Since this came right after the big alien twist, we were maybe too shocked to process just how dangerous these guys actually were, but we feel it bears mentioning on the list. Now we move to our last shared slot, Mummies from Return of the Mummy and Don't Wake Mummy. Unlike our other shared mythology slots, all three of the mummies depicted were traditional Egyptian mummies, and all of them were evil. We'll look first at Return of the Mummy, which had more lore. It had one mummy and one sister of the mummy planning as a team to take over the world and rule eternally once more. 
Then, in Don't Wake Mummy, we see a mummy being shipped to the States, where it rises and is just as violent. This one was actually a killer during his life in ancient Egypt, and is back for blood once again. These guys are dangerous, power hungry, with magic behind them, and they just don't want to stay dead. Next, we have the Gruul, from It Came From Beneath the Sink. You didn't think that we forgot about this little guy, did you? This was probably one of the most original monsters to star in the books, and then again in the show. We wish we could put him at the top just for that, but unfortunately he belongs here. The Gruul, for those of you who don't remember, is a living bad luck charm. It just happens to look like a sponge. It's especially frightening because it causes bad luck and then feeds off the negative energy it produces. There's also no reliable way of killing it. Fortunately for the family that acquires it, they learn in time that it's weakened by positive energy. This means that they're able to keep it at bay, but never destroy it. That's pretty scary too. Now let's talk about Grace from Strained Peas. She's just a baby, but a baby what? We're glad we don't have the answer because she's terrifying even at the age she is. She is well coordinated and seems to have some sort of, dare we say, satanic powers. Soon I'll be the only one. Spelling out threats with letter blocks and scaring her brother is one thing. Causing a mess in the kitchen and watching violent racing programs is maybe forgivable, but the glowing eyes, demonic recording sounds, and ability to shut off all the lights during an attack have us really concerned about what else she can do. While this wasn't one of the better or most memorable episodes, it did spawn one of the darkest entities, and we don't even know what she was. In our penultimate spot, we have the Horrorland Horrors from One Day at Horrorland. Now, these guys are probably what you think of first when you look back at Goosebumps monsters. They're fun, but also totally unforgiving. They open Horrorland and keep it running to scare children silly before luring them into their more lucrative game show. There, entire families are put to the test to either win a car or be sacrificed. It's some pretty scary stuff for a kid, and they have so much fun doing it. They are totally evil and completely unapologetic. And finally, the most evil spot goes to the mask from The Haunted Mask. Remember what we said about werewolves? How it's scary and evil because it can change a person? Well, The Haunted Mask takes that same sort of fear and amps it up. The mask not only becomes part of whomever wears it, but also starts to take them over, making them evil as well. Since it feeds off the personality of the person underneath, the mask is really capable of blurring the line between human and haunted. But this face is your face now. No. This makes it not only frightening, but inherently evil as it can bring out the monster in all of us. And that's a wrap. Our list of Goosebumps entities ranked from bad to most evil. Who did you think was the most evil monster featured on the show? And if you feel like watching more horror content, take a little Halloween visit to our Blood Binge channel, where we cover horror movies and shows in our usual binge formats. But most importantly, Happy Halloween.